impacting your local community through foster children's support. Okay, that's all I have for today. I'm going to welcome out my favorite preacher, Pastor John, for part five of our Grow series. <laughs> Favorite preacher, all right. Hey, can you guys stand with me one more time? She has to say that. She stuck with me, all right. Um, hey, I want to read for you uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. We stand when we read the word of God. One of the reminders of the authority of God's word over us. And when we get to the end, we're going to make this statement together. We're going to say this is the word of the Lord. It says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. When you fast, Jesus speaking, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Can we place our palms up like this? We just invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak. So now, Holy Spirit, come. Just awaken our hearts to you, call us deeper in our love for you and our knowledge of you and our commitment to you. And God, we ask that even in this place, as we continue as in the teaching of the word, would Jesus be so clear in his beauty, so clear to us, us we ask in the beautiful name of Jesus. And are we all together said, amen, you can be seated. So there are some times where there are certain things that you know that you ought to do. You know that they'd be a good idea for you to do it, but you just don't want to do it. Has this ever happened to anybody? And, and sometimes we excuse our just not wanting to do those things by making this statement. And we say, we were like, well, I know it should be done, and it really is probably a good idea, but we say this, but, but nobody ever actually does that, do they? As a matter of fact, can you go put that on the screen for me, and I want you to say this out loud with me little phrase. Let's say it together. Ready? Nobody ever actually does that, do they? This is one of the ways we get out of things sometimes that we know that we should do, but we don't want to do. Let me give you an example of this. When Melissa and I were married uh, almost 20 years ago now, uh, she had a little red Honda Civic. In the back of the, of the, the windshield, back windshield, had a, a, a sticker that said princess, and her license plate said princess on it. But you can imagine when I drove that car that my friends made fun of me, right? Hey, princess, how's it going, right? And so the princess car, the little red Civic, one day needed new tires. The tires were, the tread was being worn down, and they were pretty much almost bald. I remember that the person, at, you know, getting the old change was like, hey, man, you need new tires on the princess car. And then my, my friends, the little, oh, I had some older friends that we worked with, and they were wiser than me, and they were like, hey, John, uh, you probably should get some new tires for your wife in the princess car. And my own wife, like, hey, you know, I think we might need new tires, but I did not want to do that. I mean, you know, we're just newly married. I was 22. I'm thinking there's a whole lot of more important things I could be spending my money on than tires, like, you know, chilies, you know, that sort of thing, dinner. And so I decided I'd put it off. I mean, because I remember thinking to myself, like, I know they say I should get new tires for this car, but nobody ever actually changes the tires when the tires are bald, do they? Some of you are like, oh, yes, they do. Well, anyway, uh, one day <laughs> it was raining outside, pretty wet. My wife was driving in the area near Pembroke Lake Small. I don't remember exactly what happened. All I remember is she had to stop. She tried to stop. The tires didn't have any grip. She slid and almost got into an accident. How many of you know she let me know that afterwards? Like, hey, John, I'm a, what a, and um, I think I need new tires. So guess what I was doing the very next day? I was getting new tires. And here's what I figured out. I figured out that I was actually wrong. That instead of thinking nobody ever actually does that, a whole lot of people actually do that. And we call those people people with wisdom. Now, I want to start. I started with that this morning because we are landing the plane on a collection of messages called Grow. And the big idea of this series has been really simple. And it's this that God's goal is for you to what? Say it with me Grow. God's goal is for you to grow. He doesn't want you to stay stuck where you are. He doesn't want you to stay stagnant. He wants you to continue all the way through your spiritual life, growing to be conformed to the image of the Son, Jesus Christ. And we've talked about practices that help us grow. So we talked about word habit, which is our Bible reading rhythm. We talked about prayer. We talked about generosity. Last week, we talked about serving. And this week, I want to talk about one of those practices that a lot of us hear about, and then we think like, well, that is one of those things that nobody ever actually does. I want to talk today about fasting. And oftentimes we hear about fasting, 
We, we've heard sermons about it, and we think, well, I probably should do that, and that's probably a good thing, but nobody ever actually fasts, do they? I mean, maybe pastors fast, maybe missionaries fast, maybe that lady who cries at every single song during worship, maybe she fasts, but normal people like us, like we don't ever actually fast, do we? And so I want to talk about that today, and I want to say a resounding, to that, to that question, I want to say a resounding, no, 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 like there are people who actually fast, and here's my challenge, as I want us to become those kind of people. And my challenge today as we walk through what fasting is and how Jesus' vision of fasting is for you is that we grow to become people who incorporate this in our life in a way that is radically transformative. So we'll start. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Jesus speaking. This is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this. When you, what's that word there? Say it out loud with me. What? Fast. When you fast. Do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I would tell you, they have received their reward in full. Now, um, Jesus is going to be challenging us to fast, talking about fasting. But let's just start with a basic question. What is biblical fasting? Because at Crossway, we know that every single Sunday, there are some of you who've been Christians for like longer than I've been alive. There are some of you who've been Christians for a while. Some of you are new to the faith. Some of you, your friend invited you today. And I want all of us to track uh, together in the same direction. So let's talk, we're talking about fasting. What is biblical fasting? Here's what biblical fasting is. It is choosing to go without food for spiritual reasons, okay? Choosing to go without food for spiritual reasons. Now leave that up on, uh, on the screens for just a minute. Let me walk through it, right? It starts with choosing. Everyone say choosing. Okay, now this is really important when it comes to fasting. At the end of the message, I'm going to challenge us all to fast. But let's say you're a mom here, and you're like, you know, my family really should fast. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm not cooking on Wednesday. We're all fasting, okay? Like, we don't want to do that, okay? Because at the very heart of fasting, if it's going to be something transformative for you, if it's going to be something meaningful for you, it cannot be coerced, right? If you are coerced into fasting, you will be hangry and angry, and you'll probably sin more that day than the day before, okay? That's what's going to happen. So it's got to be something you choose. So we start with choosing. So choosing, and then here's the second thing, to go without food. Now, the reason I say this is because a lot of times when we talk about fasting, one of the, the biggest questions or the quickest questions that people ask is, well, like, hey, I know this whole fasting thing, but I'm not really a go without food guy. Can I just fast Instagram, right? Can I fast Netflix? Can I fast, you know, video games? And, and here's the answer. The answer is, yes, you can, like, abstain from those things, and yes, that might be a really good thing for you to do at times, but no, that isn't fasting. Biblical fasting has something to do with food, and I think there's power in going without food for a particular uh, series of time. I think there's something visceral about that. We'll get to why I think that is in a minute. So choosing to go without food, and here's the last one. For what kind of reasons? For spiritual reasons. Now, the reason I bring that up is because there's a lot of people doing a lot of type of fasting uh, all, all the time. I remember about four years ago, I was sitting with a guy in my office, and we were talking about spiritual. I was like, how's your prayer life? Yeah, he's telling me about that. I said, How, how's, your, how's your, you know, reading with scriptures? And then I said, hey, man, do you ever fast? And he's like, I fast all the time. I was like, really? Tell me about it. I'm like, spiritual giant over here. And he said, listen, about a year ago, I decided I need to lose some weight, so I started intermittent fasting, and it's been glorious. I fast all the time. Now, I, I, John, are you like down on intermittent fasting? No, I think intermittent fasting is great. It's fantastic. But intermittent fasting has a goal, and the goal is weight loss or keeping the weight off. That's not the same goal as biblical fasting. Uh, biblical fasting has a spiritual goal. As a matter of fact, when you're fasting, it's not just about like not eating. When you fast, the goal is to feast on Jesus. So as you fast, you take lunch or you take your breakfast time and you spend extra time with the Lord in prayer or in worship in his word because there's a spiritual reason, right? So choosing to go without food for spiritual reasons. That's what fasting is. Now, here's what I want to see. First thing today, really simple when it comes to fasting, is that in this passage, Jesus assumes that fasting will be a part of your life, okay? Jesus is, no, some of you are like, oh, no, no, he's not talking about me. No, 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 let me say it again. Jesus assumes that fasting will be a part of your life. Notice again the first three words of Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Notice those first three words. It says this. It says, what's that first word there? When you fast. When you fast. Did you catch that? When you fast. 
Did you notice that Jesus didn't say, if you fast? Did you catch that? He didn't say, if you're one of those people who just doesn't really care about food, like, go ahead, fast. No, Jesus says, when you fast. Now, when is the language of expectation. If you're a mom and you say to your children, this morning, when you clean your room, make sure you vacuum the floor. That, when you clean your room, there's some, there's some leeway as far as what time it's gonna happen, but when you say this morning, when you clean your room, guess what you're doing? You are setting a what? An expectation. I'm expecting you to clean. So Jesus says, when you fast. Now, who is the you that Jesus is talking to here? When you fast. Who's the, well, Jesus is not talking to a group of priests. It's not like he's got a group of priests together. Hey, you guys, you know. He's not talking to a group of pastors. He's not even just talking to the apostles. The you here, Jesus is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. So there's a large group of people there who are seeking to figure out what it looks like to follow after God. These are normal, everyday, average people. And so Jesus is looking at normal, everyday, average people. And he's like, hey, farmer, you, you farmer, when you fast. Hey, shopkeeper, you, shopkeeper, when you fast. Hey, merchant, you, when you, when you fast. Hey, mom, you, when you fast. Hey, grandparent, retired, you, when you fast. All of, when you fast, he's talking to normal people. And so we kind of, Bring that over here to 2022, right? Sitting in this room, Jesus says, when you fast, who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to you. Hey, you, nurse, when you fast. Hey, you, business owner, when you fast. Hey, stay-at-home mom, when you fast. Hey, college student, when you fast. Hey, high schooler, when you fast. He's talking to everybody who seeks to follow after Jesus. Now, for some of us, the whole concept of fasting is foreign. Like Western Christianity, this is not one of the rhythms of our life. This is one of those things that we very much are like, nobody ever actually does that except like a, a small group of people. But it hasn't always been this way. One of the interesting things, if you read some of the readings of the early church fathers in the three and four hundreds, there was a radical expectation of fasting for anybody who called themselves Christians. In the three to four hundreds, um, the, the expectation was for the average Christian that you would fast on Wednesdays and Fridays till sundown, and then you would fast the 40 days of Lent leading up to Easter. So every year, you're fasting 40 days, and you're fasting two times a week. If you were a pastor of a church during that era, and you were not willing to fast two times a week and the 40 days leading up to Easter, you would be kicked out of your job. And they could excommunicate Christians if you were unwilling to fast twice a week in the 40 days leading up to Easter. So I start with that because next week we're starting something new at Crossway. And um, <laughs> two days a week and the 40, no, okay. And I'm not saying that because I'm saying we need to do it. I'm just saying that to go like, whoa, 2022 Western American South Floridian Christianity, at times the expectation is very, very different and radically different from some of the early church. And so here's what I want to say to you. If you're sitting here this morning and you're like, man, I'm a disciple, sure. I want to feel like, I want to follow Jesus. Please understand that Jesus assumes, you expect, like this is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So he starts with, okay, we know what fasting is. There's sort of an expectation. The second thing I want us to see, because Jesus is going to sort of issue a warning for us as we fast. And notice, so I'm going to kind of give you in my words the warning and then we'll see his language. The first thing we need to realize for the warning about fasting is this, is that fasting should be for God, not your pride. Fasting should be for God, not your pride. You say, well, how in the world could fasting be about my pride? Well, in the context of that particular audience, it was a very, very religious culture. And so if you were someone who was fasting and fasting regularly, like people looked up to you, man. They were like, wow, look at Look at her, she's so spiritual. So Jesus noticed what he says. He says, when you fast, talking to them, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they notice this, they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So here's what was going on, because this is a culture that was very religious and all of that. When the, oftentimes the Pharisees, they fasted twice a week. When they would fast, what they would do is they would put like ashes on their head and they would kind of smear it on their face and they would walk around looking really sad. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen this, 
this uh, filter that's going around on social media where someone's face looks like they're weeping. Have you seen this? It's like, Ugh. has anybody seen this? Am I the only person? Okay, thank you, Tessa. We, oh, yeah, we got a few more over here, right? I just kind of envision the Pharisees like that. They're just walking around like, uh, you know, and, and say, well, why, why are they doing that? Because they, they walk around like looking really, really sad and, and they, they want people to ask them, yo, what's up? And they're like, oh, like, I just gotta be honest, like things are tough and like, well, what's going on? I'm fasting, man. I'm just, I just love God, but it's not about me. It's for him. It's just for, it's for him. It's totally for him. And what they want is people to ask them to notice and then to go, boy, you're so spiritual. Like, wow, look at you. It must be hard. Oh, it is hard. Like, that's what they want them to do. And Jesus is like, stop that, right? It is never supposed to be about your pride. It is always supposed to be about God. Now, we might, you know, again, because this isn't part of our culture, we might, not, we might hear this and think to ourselves, that is ridiculous. Like, who would ever take something spiritual like that, right, and then turn it into something about then, something as sacred as fasting, and turn it into something about then? And let me, can I just remind you, uh, any spiritual practice, any good, beautiful, wonderful spiritual practice can be turned into something that is about us and not about God. Real quickly, any practice, generosity talked about generosity a few weeks ago man like generosity is good it is important it is significant but boy when our hearts get messed up about it sometimes we can give and go like hey look at me and it can be about us not about who god serving i mean serving is something that we all are called to do right like i want everybody at crossway finding your place to serve but serving can become something where it's about us and not about god can, can i um can i just share with you a, a moment in my life where this was happening uh, this is a little bit of a confession. Is this a safe place for me to confess something here? Wow, I got a couple yeses. Sarita, thank you. The rest of you are a little sketch, though. You're like, I don't know, and it depends what it is. <laughs> so, like, when I was, in, like, later high school and um, into college, I, I've always loved worship. Worship's been a big part of my life. I've, I've always loved music, been a musician, that sort of thing. And so there was a point in time where I was starting to, like, become, do worship stuff, and uh, later on, I'd, I'd be a worship leader for, like, eight years, and but before that, I would be in the audience, and because I loved worship, I'd be like a very expressive worship, worshiper, right? And I'd be a very loud worshiper, you know? And back in the day, we're doing songs like Shout to the Lord, you know, like Shout to the Lord, you know, harmony part, doing the whole thing, right? All in. Now, at the beginning, I'm, I'm just going all in for Jesus because I love him, but then there'd be a couple times where, I, where someone would like, at the end of the worship set, they would literally, set, they'd turn around and be like, hey, man, I just saw you worshiping. Look, it touched me, man. Your voice so great. Just keep it up, right? First time that happened, I'm like, yeah, just about Jesus, man. And then, like, it happens another time. Oh, I saw you worshiping. Just, wow, that was so good. And, and it happened a couple times. And what started to happen was my heart, like, my words were like, it's for the Lord. But my heart was like, keep it coming. Love the compliments. This is great. And then, now this is the, like, really moment of confession here. So please try not to judge me. And then there came a time in my life, and I'm just being straight up honest, we're in the middle of like worship. I'm in the audience. My hands would be raised. I'd be singing like really loud. My eyes would be closed. But every now and then, like one of my eyes would look around like, is anybody noticing me? Do they notice my worship right now, right? And I mean, guys, that's horrible, by the way. Can we just like, that is terrible. That's like not, what is it about? And, and, and the Holy Spirit, literally the Holy Spirit had to like, pa, 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 you know, smack me in the face one day and convicted me. It was like, John, you're taking something sacred and you're making it about you. It's not about you. And so like, there was a whole, see, this is actually true. There was a whole season after that, whenever I was sitting in the audience worshiping, I would like whisper worship, right? Shout to the Lord all the earth. And I would, because I had to like get my heart in the place to say, John, this isn't about you. And Jesus is looking at the Pharisees and he's like, guys, you're fasting twice a week, but it's about you. You want everybody to see it. You're trying to take something sacred and make it about your pride. And Jesus says, it's not about that. Instead, here's what we are ought to do. But when you fast, complete opposite of that. Don't draw attention to yourself. It's not about look at me. It's not about how holy I am. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who, notice this, sees what is done in, what's that word there? Say it with me, secret. We'll reward you. Isn't that beautiful? It's like, this is what fast, fasting isn't about the show. It's like, it's like it's fasting is what you do with you and the Lord and the Father in secret. You know, I, I, I heard that phrase I was, as I was studying this week, and I thought, that's a really interesting phrase. 
that Jesus says, the Father who sees what is done in secret, because that phrase can feel very different depending on how you say it, right? Like if I read that and go, and the Father who sees what is done in secret, like that can feel like, whoa, whoa, hey, hey, hey. Now, it's true, he does see what is done in secret. Like that's true. But that's not the way Jesus is using it. Jesus is using that phrase very different. He's looking to people and he's like, guys, he says, don't you understand this about the Father? He sees the good that you are doing in secret. And because you do it in secret and unto him alone, he will reward you. That's a beautiful promise. And as I was was studying this, I just had the sense from the Holy Spirit that maybe there's someone here in this room who needs to hear that. I just had the sense that maybe there's someone in this room that needs to hear, like, there's some things you're doing for the Lord in secret that nobody else knows. And the Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Maybe you're, like, really trying to forgive someone in secret. Nobody else knows. But the Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Maybe you're here and you are crying out to him in prayer in secret. He sees you. Maybe you're being generous in secret. He sees you. Maybe you're being long-suffering in love in secret. He sees you. Maybe you're putting hours in serving others in secret. He, he sees you. This is the Father. He sees you so good. And I just want to encourage you, like, as you serve him in secret, not only does he see you, but he rewards you. And Jesus is like fasting. Like, when you create a rhythm of this in your life, it's not about, like, blast it on TikTok so that everybody can like it. It's about you and the Lord in the secret place. And he sees you and he rewards you. Now, as we say that, just two thoughts on, because you might hear that and be like, okay, okay, John, I've never done this. Some of you are like, John, you're talking to me about something I've never done, uh, and okay, maybe I should, okay, maybe there's something good about that, and I get it's supposed to be done in circuit, but John, like, why does this whole thing matter? How could me skipping my cafe con leche for breakfast and my lunch, how could that, and spending time with Jesus, how could that have anything to do with my spiritual growth? Like, why does that matter to God so much? So, so two Two thoughts on that. Here's the first one. Why we fast, okay? Why this helps us grow. You fast to train yourself to say no to the flesh. Can you say that out loud with me? We fast to train yourself to say no to the flesh. Now, this is really significant, and it's an area of fasting I think many of us don't often think about. Uh, What happens when you fast? Like, what you're doing is fasting is a moment of humbling ourselves before God and requesting his power. Like, God, we need your power. And when it comes to the flesh, fasting is a moment where we humble ourselves before the Lord, asking for his power to overcome the temptation of the flesh. Um, Just kind of give an illustration of why this is important. Uh, About two and a half years ago, at some point, it was like pre-COVID or right in the beginning stages of COVID, I decided I wanted to learn how to run. I don't mean like, you know, I mean, I know how to run, but like, not just that. I mean, like, run a good distance. I had in my mind, I want to run a 5K. And so I did the first thing, most important thing. I went to Runner's Depot and bought a really good pair of shoes, right? And I felt like a fraud, I got to be honest. I mean, here, there's all these athletes, and I'm like, I can't even run a minute, but I got to buy me some good shoes. I bought some nice, expensive running shoes. And then I started to run around my neighborhood, and the loop around my neighborhood is, an, is a mile, And so I would walk and run and walk and run. And I got pretty okay, but I couldn't break the mile. (laughs) And some of you runners are like, dude, you are a wimp. Okay, I know, but I'm just getting started, right? So I couldn't couldn't break the mile. So I'm running, and and I happened to be talking to my buddy Jason. He has a PhD in sports medicine, so this is his world. And I was like, dude, I can't break the mile. It's like I get so close, but my legs are hurting and my lungs are on fire, and I just can't do it. And I'm going to paraphrase the conversation, but he said, essentially, John, it's all in your head. I'm like, you call me crazy? Like, wait, no. It's like, no, no, no. He's like, Here's the deal. Your body is trying to tell you you can't do it. It's screaming at you to tell you you can't do it. And what you have to do is you have to tell your body, oh, you are going to do it. Right? Like, you, your brain has to say, body, we're doing this. And then he looks at me and says, listen, I just want you to know, if you try to run that mile and you, you keep running, you're not going to die. He says, you, you will not die. Your body might try to tell you that you're going to die, but you're not going to die. And so I'm like, okay, I got to tell my body. And the next day, like, I'm like, I'm going to tell my body. And guess what I did? The next day, I ran the mile. And the next day after that, guess what I did? I ran two miles. Now, just to not inflate my story here, uh, that was the only time I ever ran two miles in my entire life. (laughs) Okay, but I did it that day, right? My brain told my body, we're going to do this. And then I got COVID. Uh, It was my first bout of COVID, and it knocked me out for a while. And I haven't run since. So guess what I need to do? Go to Runner's Depot and get a new pair of shoes, right? I got to get back in this thing. Got to get a new pair of shoes. Now, 
my, my point of all that, you're like, what does that have to do with fasting? Okay, hang with me. My point of that is this, is that there are times in which you have to tell your body, hey, body, I'm not gonna listen to you. Now, I know there are times you have to listen to your body. I'm not trying to say don't listen to your body. But there are times, especially if you're an athlete, right? If I'm going to run that mile or two or I'm going to do the 5K, I'm going to run the half marathon or I'm going to do the marathon, I actually have to instruct. I'm like, no, we are going to do this. I'm not going to listen to you right now. Now, here's why I use that illustration, because our bodies are good. They've been given to us by God, so our bodies are good. But sin has affected even our body and even our desires. And there are times in which your flesh is going to try to yell at you, this is what you need to do in something that is contrary to what Jesus wants you to do. And if you're gonna grow in spiritual maturity, you're gonna have to learn to say no to your flesh. Listen to how Paul the Apostle says it in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, which was their like trophy, right? But we, an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But listen to what he says here. But I, and what are those three words? Say it with me. Discipline my body. I discipline my body. And keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Guys, there are going to be times in which your sex drive is telling you to do something that you ought not to do, and you have to learn to say no. There are going to be times where fight or flight response starts to kick in, and the fight response has kicked in, and you want to fight with your words or with your fists, and you have to tell your, I got to discipline my body, I got to say no. There are going to be times the desire for overindulgence kicks in, and I've got to say no. That's what Paul's saying. Like, there are times in which our own flesh is going to be screaming, like, here's what needs to be done, and we have to learn how to train ourselves to say no. Here's how that engages with fasting. Listen, I'm going to challenge you at the end of this message to take a day this week, maybe for the first time or first time in a long time, to fast, right? And if you haven't fasted in a long time, let me tell you what's going to happen. Your body is going to scream at you. (laughs) Your stomach's going to rumble. You might even feel anxious. You, you might feel nervous. Like, you're, it's going to be like, feed me. What are you doing? Nobody ever actually does this. Right? This is only for fanatics. Your body's going to tell you, you must be a religious nut. Like, that's what's happened. What is going on? It's going to tell you to, 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 to give in. And here's what you're going to do. Okay, in fasting, here's what you're doing. You are, you, are, you are humbling yourself before God, and you're saying, God, I need your power to overcome my flesh. And you're going to say no to your flesh. And as you say no to your flesh, guess what you're doing? You are training yourself to say no to your flesh. You're going to be training yourself so that when the flesh wants you to engage, you're going to have the strength to say no. Here's what I've seen, and some of you have seen this. There are people who've been Christians for like 30 years. They know all the answers in small group. They know Bible verses. They know theology. They serve on teams, but they have not matured spiritually in 30 years. And the reason why, one of the reasons why people sometimes don't mature is because they never learn how to say no to the flesh. They never train their flesh, discipline their flesh. No, I'm a follower of Jesus. The spirit of Christ lives in me. I don't have to listen every time you speak. And if you don't discipline your flesh, listen, if you don't train your flesh, your flesh will train you. That's how it works. It's gotta be one of the two. And fasting, and especially regular fasting, is this process in which we are regularly going to the Holy Spirit. God, I need your strength. God, I need your power. God, teach me. God, give me strength. And we're training our flesh so that we are able to stand in the moment of temptation. I'll give give, give an example of this, sort of a reverse example. We see how this works. Um, So when Melissa and I were first married, we were on staff at a church in the area. And the pastor and his wife we were friends with. And he was a mentor to me, a gifted, gifted guy. Some of you knew him, actually. And uh, in our first year of marriage, he had a massive moral failure where he uh, cheated on his wife. He left his wife, married the other woman as a whole explosion in the area, incredible amount of pain. And so here we are, under a year married, seeing this whole thing, like just like nuclear bomb in the church go off and, and a moral failure. And, and I had to think a lot of like, how does this happen, right? Some of you had to go through these, like, how does that happen? And then over, this is like 20 years ago now, 
over those 20 years, I've had other friends who have had significant, like, spiritual leadership positions just kind of implode and implode. And I've had to go and, like, how does this happen? How does this happen? I've thought a lot about it. And here's what I think we often think. I think that the often, we often have this idea of how spiritual failure happens, that especially if you've got someone in leadership, you think, well, here's what happens. Here you have a very spiritually strong person, and they're walking along, and they're doing really, really good, but all of a sudden, here's this like rock in the path. This is like massive temptation. It's just something that's too strong to be able to say no to, and you've got this otherwise really spiritually strong person going around, and then all of a sudden, boom, they just kind of fall because, boy, that temptation was too big, and it was too strong, and that's how they fell is the language we often use. But what I've seen over the years is that's actually not often how spiritual failure takes place. It's not just like a, everyone's healthy, and then, boom, I fall and trip over it. We don't fall into significant spiritual sin. Here's what happens. You slide into it. And what I mean by that is this, is that your flesh is trying to train you. And if the flesh can scream, do this or do that or whatever, that's contrary to the Lord in something little, and you say yes, then it's going to ask again. And you say yes, and it's going to ask again. And you say yes. And then over time, what's going to happen is you're giving in to the flesh and all sorts of little sinful things. Oh, it's not that big deal. It's just a little. It's just a little look. It's just a little that. It's just go to that place for a little bit or just a little bit of a gray area. It's just little, 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 and little things. And then here's what the flesh does. It starts to kind of go into medium things. But it's not just little anymore. But then what happens, if you're not training the flesh, guess what? The flesh is training you. And it's going to train you in some medium things. So so we got some some sin here, a little bit medium-sized sin, a little bit more here. And and, and then what happens is there are going to be moments of sin that can take out your whole life, that can ruin your marriage. There can be moments of sin that can destroy your reputation, there can be moments of sin that can destroy your credibility, those sort of things, right? That just that thing, you give into it, like that can just blow the whole thing up, right? And what happens is that the flesh has trained you all this time, and you've just said, yes, 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 so you've been sliding, and then we come to this moment that can blow up your life. You have not trained yourself to say no to the flesh, so what do you think is gonna happen in the moment of consequence? You're going to give in to it. What happens? Nobody just walking around spiritually completely healthy, saying no to the flesh, and they just trip up and fall. You slide into it. Fasting, guys, is one of the rhythms. It's one of the practices where the people of God say, I don't want the flesh to train me. I, through the Spirit of God, I'm going to train my flesh to be an ally in my process of sanctification. I want to look like Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. And so I'm going to train. I'm going to discipline my body and bring it into subjection so that at the end of the day, I'm not disqualified. You with me, Crossway? And fasting is that rhythm. And I think so many of us, like, if you think about the early church and, like, this crazy thing, they're fasting twice a week and all this. And then you think about the type of temptation they had. So we'll talk about the temptation of the early church, right? We're talking about temptation. Well, okay, it's hard for me not to look at porn. It's hard for me not to look at that. You know what the early church, their temptation, they'd be getting, they'd taken by the Roman government, hey, either you deny Christ or you will be killed. We'll talk about temptation, that's temptation. How did they have the strength in that day to stand? Because through the process of disciplining yourself towards righteousness, you begin to teach the flesh, I'm not listening to you, man. You're going to be in this journey with me to follow Jesus. So fasting is part of this process. We train the flesh. Here's the second thing and the last thing. We fast when we need God's intervention. Why don't you say that out loud with me? Let's do it together. Ready? We fast when we need God's intervention. Here's what I mean by that. There are some situations in your life, that are you, like problems that come up, that you could call like life, they're, they're, they're like speed bumps, Right? They're difficult, they might be painful, they might be problems, but they don't knock you out. Like God has already given you the intellectual resources, the financial resources, the relational resources, whatever, to deal with those, those little speed bumps. So like if you're here in this room and you're married, there will be arguments in your marriage. Now, that was a little bit of a test. I was waiting to see if anybody would amen, and you guys all passed the test, right? Like, don't want to amen too loud. Amen, preaching, problems. No, don't do that, right? If you're married, there will be, it's just are, right? It doesn't matter how wonderful your wife is, how wonderful your husband is, you know, like there will, because we're, you know, in the process of sanctification. Now, here's the thing. Not every marriage conflict is, is going to, is a, is, a, is a crisis. Some of them are issues that you just confess to each other, you forgive, you move on. It's a speed bump, right? Some of you are going to have issues where you've got health issues. Not every health issue is a crisis or you have the resource to deal with it. Okay, so some 
problems in life are speed bumps, but there's some problems in life. Now, follow me here because you've been through this, right? Some of you, maybe you're at this place right now. Some problems in life aren't speed bumps. They're like brick walls. You know what I'm talking about? So there are some marriage problems that aren't just a little whoop. It's like a boom, brick wall. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There are some health issues that aren't just a little speed bump. It's a brick wall. The doctors aren't sure what we should do. There are some relationship issues that aren't just a speed bump. It's a brick wall. I really don't know how I'm going to restore this relationship of all these years. I feel like I've lost it. There are some uh, mental health issues that aren't speed bumps. There are brick walls. I just feel like I'm constantly dealing with anxiety and fear and depression. I can hardly get out of bed. There are some situations in your life that aren't speed bumps. They're brick walls. What do we, we as the people of God do in those moments? Like, what, what is our response in those moments, right? I mean, let me tell you what oftentimes the response of the culture and things like this is that we numb ourselves and distract ourselves to death by scrolling on social and Instagram and all. We just numb ourselves. Or we numb ourselves by drinking and drinking and drinking or using some other drug. We numb ourselves from the pain. Or we just crumple up and say, there's nothing that can be done. But the people of God, here's what we do. We go to the Lord and fast. Just one quick little verse, and then I'm going to close with this challenge. I, I, it's this story in 2 Chronicles 20, verses 21 and 1 and 2. It says this. Uh, this is Jehoshaphat. This is Judah, the southern kingdom. Jehoshaphat was a godly king. And it says, after this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, with some of the Meunites and the Mosquito Bites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. <laughs> I just put that one in there. Uh, some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom. From the other side of the Dead Sea, it is already in Hazazon Tamar, that is in En Gedi. Okay, but bottom line, real quick, Jehoshaphat has all these armies up against him. And this is not, for Jehoshaphat, a speed bump. This isn't like a, oh, I can figure it out, you know, just got to get the right generals on this. This is a brick wall. He does not have the power to defeat these armies. But notice what Jehoshaphat does. Well, first, his response, verse 3. Here's the word of verse 3. It says this, alarmed. Everyone say alarmed. Some of you have been alarmed in situations in your life. Some of you have been alarmed by the brick walls that, that you've come up against recently. Alarmed. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a, what's that word there? Fast. For all Judah, the people of God, came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. You know what I love about this? Jehoshaphat realized, brick wall. Like, like this, this, this thing, man, we need his intervention. Like this thing, if God doesn't come through, like we're out here. And, and here's the deal. This is a story that's told all the way throughout the Bible of the people of God. When we come to these brick walls, we don't crumple in fear. We don't just numb the pain. We go to the Lord and say, God, we need your intervention. There's some of you who are brick wall moments. You've done everything else but seek God in fasting. Like what would happen if we as a church gathered each other together and you got your connect group and you said, guys, I'm going through this. Will you fast with me this week? Because I need the hand of God's intervention. What would happen if us as friends or family members, we called each other up and said, listen, I'm hitting a brick wall here. I need, would you fast with me? Like, what would happen if this didn't become the thing? Like, nobody ever actually, but Crossway, like we as a people said, no, we believe that there is a living God, that he wants to intervene, that he can intervene. And this is one of the practices that he's given us to intervene in the moments of brokenness and pain. Just wonder if God might do some things that would blow our minds. Now, you might say, you might say, well, John, well, if I fast, does that mean that God, it'll go away if I fast? I mean, he'll take, here's what I believe. There's two things that happen when we fast. It's either one, God's going to come in and he's going to remove the situation. Sometimes he does that. He doesn't always do that. The other times he comes in and he gives you the grace will be sufficient for you to walk through. But here's the deal. We need one of those two things. We seek the Lord. Crossway, like, let us not be the church. That hears that and go like, ah, oh, man, that's for somebody else. Like, like, let us be the people who say, Jesus, we take you seriously. We take you seriously. I want to follow you in this way. So here's my challenge. Uh, if you put that next last slide up, here's a, is a little challenge, okay? You can take up your phone if you don't mind real quick. I'm going to close with this, but I want you to just take a picture of that or go ahead and text the word FAST to 855-888-9191. Uh, just leave it up for a minute. And here's what I want, why I want you to do that. Um, I'll, if you do that, I'll send you a little, just a real simple fasting guide for this week. My challenge to you is this. You've never fasted before. 
would you pick a day this week and fast and, and, and actually say, Jesus, I'm gonna, I, wanna, I wanna learn to train my flesh. I wanna seek your power. I wanna grow. So Lord, I'm gonna do it. So take a day this week and say, I'm gonna do it. Um, I'd love for you to do that. And I'll send you a simple fasting guide. It'll be sent back right to you. Um, that'll help you kind of process that. And during your fast, okay, this week, I would love to know if you end up fasting and in that process, maybe you sense the Holy Spirit is speaking some things to you. Just send a text back to that number. That's the number we, we can check. Send us a text back. I would just love to hear, like if the Lord is speaking to you in that, in that process. So one is the challenge, consider fasting. And then I'm gonna give you one more challenge, which is like, what would happen? Okay, now hang with me here. But would you consider, maybe some of you, this is what the Lord wants you to do. What if you said this whole month of June, I'm gonna take one day a week and I'm gonna fast the entire month of June. What if you began, some of you, not just once, but said, let me see about this becoming a pattern, a process in my life, a rhythm of my life. Boy, could you imagine if we were that kind of church? Could you imagine if you were that kind of dad, that kind of wife, that kind of parent, that kind of friend who's continually seeking the power of the Holy Spirit in a situation? I think the Lord can move. I think the Lord do beautiful things. So let's pray and ask him to do that. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts to this. So there's some of us who like this sounds so foreign, it's so out of our comfort zone and it's so out of anything we've ever done before. But God, we wanna grow. We don't wanna stay where we are. We don't wanna stay stagnant. So Holy Spirit, God, give us courage to follow in the way of Jesus, all the way in the way of Jesus and the things that are easy and the things that are hard. But Lord, in this, I pray, Lord, as we begin this new rhythm, some of us, God, would you meet us? Would you speak to us? Would you strengthen us? Would you give us some of us power and, and victory over issues that we've had in our flesh for a long time? Father, I pray that some of us would have intervention moments where you'd rescue us from problems or you'd give us the grace to walk through even difficult times. God, we are asking that you'd see us, that you'd hear us, Lord. And Lord, I thank you that you are such a good father, that you're the one who sees what is done in secret. And so as my brothers and sisters in this room, like process this and seek to live this out in secret, Lord God, would you reward them in beautiful ways. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone together said, amen. Hey, stand with me. I wanna speak a blessing over you before we go. A couple things. One is next week, we're starting a brand new teaching series through the summer, walking through the book of James. So if you want to get a head start and you're an overachiever, start reading James chapter one, right? Start working through that. A couple other reminders. If you're interested in some next step information about four kids, stop by there. Um, if you'd like to sign up final day for the early bird rate for uh, our Crossway Youth uh, Retreat, you can stop by there. And if you're a first time guest, we'd love to give, a, give you a gift and just thank you for being with us. Stop our Connect Center on your way out. All right, Crossway, let me speak this blessing over you as you go. Now, Crossway, as you go, go and live your life for the glory of God the Father, resting in the grace of his son Jesus, strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit because you are a city on a hill and a light to South Florida. Go in peace. We love you guys. We'll see you next week. Is how your strength is perfected. So won't you create in me true dependence? Because I don't want to fall asleep, my Lord. I don't want to fall asleep. So let revival come awaken deep inside of me. Consuming every single thing that is a part of me. For I am not my own, I died so very long ago. So Holy Spirit, I relinquish all of my control. I don't want to fall asleep, my Lord. I don't want to fall asleep, my Lord. I don't want to fall asleep, my Lord. To live or die, no more compromise. When I met God, I gave up all my rights. So won't you let me be a living sacrifice? Cause I don't wanna